And now, for our last and intriguing guest this evening, he was born and raised in a Jewish family on the east side of Manhattan. He will never forget his first encounter with politics at the age of five, attending a rally with John F. Kennedy, being taken by the scene and the person, and later by the magic and energy of the political games. 50 years later, David Axelrod is America's ultimate campaign manager and strategist, the man behind Barack Obama, the strategist who made it happen twice, bringing the first black president to the White House. David Axelrod, please. Hi. Thank you for being with Good us. Good to be here. You know, I read some analysts that wrote as political scientists dissect how a junior senator with a funny name and little experience on the national stage was able to dethrone the Clintons and then overtake America twice. Much of the credit will likely go to the man they call the ex. <laughs> but I want to ask you, when, when was it that you realized you knew Barack Obama many years before you ran his campaign to the White House? I wonder when is it that you reckon this guy should be, indeed could be, the President of the United States? Well, I, I will tell you that my introduction to Barack Obama came from a friend in Chicago named Betty Lou Saltzman. Uh, she's the daughter of Philip Klutznik, who was once President of the World Jewish Congress. And Betty Lou is an activist in Chicago, and she called me up in 1992, and she said, I just met the most remarkable young man, and I think you need to meet him. I was prominent in political consulting in, in Chicago. And I said, well, I'm happy to meet anybody you want me to meet, but why do you want me to meet him? And she said, I have a feeling he could be president of the United States someday. This was in 1992. She said. She said that. She said that, yes. So um, my, I always say when I go to the racetrack, I take her with me now. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, you know, I, uh, I had a very high opinion of him. I didn't really work with him when he was in the state senate. He didn't need my help. Um, we really teamed up in 2002. We were both at kind of inflection points in our careers. We both were a little bit, he, he had lost a race for Congress um, and he w had one more campaign in him and if it didn't work he was going to uh, move on. And you didn't think back then that he would run? I didn't think what? That he would run for president. Well, at that time, he was a state senator thinking about running a long shot race for the United States Senate. And I was a little despairing about the quality of politics and, uh, in our state. And I decided that um, I would, if I could be part of helping him get elected to the United States Senate, Senate that would help be... recharge my own batteries, recharge my and idealism. So, you did. so I did. And it was during that campaign that I learned. Uh, things about him that made me think that this guy was going to be a real force in national politics. And it goes deeper than his skills, his ability, his rhetoric, his, 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 his intellect. It goes to a story that he's really telling. And that, they say that that's your claim to fame, that you, you, you can diagnose within your candidates a kind of story that you can mine from their, their biographies and would resonate with voters. What is the well, story? Well, I mean, let me, let me just say something about him. that, because I, the reason that I feel as I, I think biography is very important. And I said earlier on a panel that I think authenticity is very important, ultimately, if you're going to be successful. So I want to build campaigns around uh, the qualities a person has. I don't want to impute to that candidate uh, qualities that he doesn't have. And he had some really extraordinary qualities. And his story, you know, raised by a single mother, uh, a biracial, um, uh, he had lived overseas, he had experienced um, struggle in his life. Um, the, the first thing that I learned in that Senate race about Obama was he, he would go to downstate Illinois, which was, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with American geography, downstate Illinois is closer to the deep south than it is to Chicago. And so, naturally, I thought it would be challenging for him down there. And I'd get calls from this young man who was traveling with him, and they said, gee, he's doing very well down here. And I was really surprised, and I said to him, how could this be? And he said, you know, you, I don't know why you're so surprised. He said, these people, they're just like my grandparents from Kansas. We talk about how my grandfather was in uh, Patton's Army, a famous uh, division. And, and um, uh, we talk about how my grandmother worked in a factory, um, uh, Rosie the Riveter, making war 
implement, implements during World War II. And he said, we have a good time. And I realized over time that here was someone who was comfortable in any room in which he went. Inner city church, uh, in, in a Tony suburbs, in a, a, a VF, in a, a church basement in downstate uh, and and that quality and in, in the Harvard Law School or the Chicago Law right School. yes but but you're confident enough now and he's big enough now and great enough now for you to be able to tell me about his weakness what yeah. was back then the, the the most important or the most disturbing weakness that you tracked down you know um, I heard before I came here that you were Israel's most probing hard-hitting interview and I take it as a compliment if you don't well point. I showed up anyway <laughs> Uh, That's but, a uh, for you. but um, no, I, I've been open about this. When he decided to when when he decided to run for president, you know, we had run uh, we had we had a very successful race for the United States Senate. He was wildly popular in Illinois. He was never really attacked in an effective way. He never had a big negative media campaign against him. And he, frankly, when he did get attacked, he was pretty reactive. He didn't like it. And I said to him, I don't know how you're going to handle taking a punch, that this is going to be the big challenge, that the, because they are going, you are, now we're in the big time here, and they're going to come after you with uh, everything they've got. And, um, and, you know, what I learned over time, and I think what he learned about himself over time, that uh, he, in fact, could do that, that he was... Uh, that he, 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 he rolled well with the punches, and he, uh, it didn't, he didn't lose his uh, balance uh, when those attacks came. You know, I was telling you before that I will never forget the night of November 4th, 2008. It was early morning in this country, and I watched his acceptance speech in Grand Park in yes. Chicago. I had tears in my eyes. I saw history in the making. I wonder where you have been at that moment. I was standing uh, right by the stage, and I, of course, had tears in my eyes, too, because we had taken this extraordinary journey. I mean, when he decided uh, to run for the Senate, that was unlikely. When he decided to run for president, that was unlikely. And so I was proud of what we had done. I was proud of my country for embracing him, because many thought that couldn't happen. But I also was very uh, sober, uh, because um, though I had had a few drinks as well, but I was sober uh, because I uh, knew the responsibilities that he was about to undertake. And you, I knew we were under crisis, and I knew that it was almost impossible to meet the expectations of this crowd of people mm -hmm. there who were filled with uh, hope for the future. And uh, so um, it, was a, it, was, it was a strangely mixed uh, feeling that night for me. Yeah, no Messiah can, can ever fulfill the expectations that were flooding the crowd back then in Chicago. But you know, I wonder, then you get to Washington for the first time in your life. You yes. land in Washington, D.C., you become a senior advisor to the president. And I wonder what happens to the relationship between the campaign manager who kind of orchestrates the campaign and the candidate himself. But then you're in the Oval Office and you have to take another kind of position. Although you have this great access to the president, how do you manage that? You know, before, I, you're right, I never worked in Washington by design, by, by choice, because I always felt that um, you get a warped perspective in Washington about what's going on in the rest of the country. I love Chicago as well, uh, but I also knew that I was better at politics for having lived not in Washington, but where most Americans uh, live. Um, and when he asked me to come, I was reluctant. And there was another reason I was reluctant, which, and I told him this, and I said, you know, I've structured my whole life so that I could, uh, and I'm going to clean this up for this audience, but I, 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 I could tell any, anybody I, uh, to go jump in a lake, essentially, <laughs> to take a hike. And, um, Including and, and, Barack Obama. Yes, and I said, but you can't say that to the President of the United States. And he said, well, no, you really can't, but, and then he made the arguments for why I should come. And at the end of it, he said, you know, uh, one other thing, he said, you can tell me that, just don't do it in, any, in front of anybody else. And so you didn't. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that I, I've been candid with him. I continue to be candid with him. Uh, I think that's what friends do. But I, I, it, there haven't been many occasions. I'll give you one example, okay. which intrigues me and, and, and is amazingly interesting for me. The last campaign, the first debate in Denver, Colorado. Yes. The one to which they say he never appeared. He wasn't really there. 
Yes. You meet him backstage. Yes. Immediately after the debate. No, I actually he had left. I was uh, unfortunately. He didn't want I was, to see I was, you. I was he detailed. didn't want to meet you. He, he was didn't want uh, to no, no, no. To I was detailed to uh, talk to a, a a phalanx of reporters. To spin it out. To spin. It's a difficult evening. <laughs> and um, as I was driving back to the hotel, I talked to him. Can you tell him, Mr. President? I didn't have to tell him. He said, I think that uh, I'm reading the clips. It seems that the consensus is we didn't have a very good night. And I would say, yes, that appears to be the consensus. <laughs> Was there a moment, David, during that campaign that you thought realistically that he might be a one-term president? You know, the honest answer is I did not. I did not. I never, ever thought we were going to lose that election. Um, I think uh, that, uh, uh, you know, maybe there were times when he, before the campaign began, you know, he, you just bombarded with negativism. I think he was psychologically prepared that it might not work out. But I never believed that. And I'll tell you one reason I, I thought we were going to win. Um, in 2010, we had a very difficult election from our perspective. Lost um, 63 seats in the United States House, which was, uh, you know, not a record, but close. And, um, uh, but the Republican Party had been dragged very far to the right in that election. And I believed that, and I told him this the day after the election, I think the seeds of our re-election have been planted. Uh, and he looked at me like I was crazy. But I thought that um, anybody who was running for president on the Republican side was going to have to pay tribute to the right wing of that party to the, to the degree that they would not be able to win a general election. And that's part of the story of what happened. But then when Romney appeared to be taking a lead or at least becoming a threat, you go negative. And I ask you, is there anything you regret in that specific campaign? Um, well, I regret that first debate. <laughs> That's not something that you're responsible to. I, must, uh, you know what, I just you... wanted to hear you say that I wasn't responsible. <laughs> no, you can hear me. You <laughs> I'm can not hear sure me. the president agrees you can with that. Hear, <laughs> you can hear me quote yourself. You said once that negative media is like radiation therapy. Yes. It's hard to judge when you're curing or killing. Right. So th sometimes you're killing. Well. You, if you use negative media indiscriminately, uh, it, will, it will have a, a negative effect on you. It will define you. So the question is, when you, if you're going to attack an opponent, is the attack fair? Is it grounded? Is it well documented? Um, is it within the parameters of what people are willing to accept? And, uh, you know, I believe that what, uh, that, uh, that was what we did. We, we made a case. Um, it was particularly important around the economy because Governor Romney was presenting himself as someone who could, uh, who could cure a what was wrong with the economy. Right. So it was incumbent on us to talk about what that business experience entailed. It was incumbent on us to talk about uh, what his record was as governor of Massachusetts. And there was not one instance in which you're afraid in retrospect that you went overboard? Uh, I, from our campaign, no. There were ads that were run that we objected to, and we said we objected to them, that I think were inappropriate. Uh, and, but, you know, we were very careful about what, we, uh, about what we ran. I want to ask you in the couple of minutes that we have left about what's going on these days in the U.S. and the, in the Obama administration, not only the NSA surveillance pro pro uh, program, but also before that, the IRS scandal and the Benghazi affair and so many scandals. And I, I'm wondering, is it simply bad luck, bad media, or perhaps bad decision making in the White House? Well, um, you know, the, the Appalachian scandal is used pretty liberally. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that there are, there are things that are scandalous. I think there are what Benghazi uh, was a terrible event. And there were plainly mistakes, big mistakes made leading up to it. And the administration appointed uh, a committee of prominent Americans, and they issued a scathing report about it. And I think you can't prevent every bad event. 
and you do make mistakes. The question is, what do you do when I, they're made? I made a mistake. I shouldn't have mentioned Benghazi. The RRS and the NSA and the yeah, Prince well, program too late now. are bad. <laughs> But, all right, well, let's Our talk about idea. the IRS. Um, I was and, in the White House and, yeah, at that we, we time. Got, I was we in got the... to, to make people understand it, that, yes. that it was found that employees were targeting conservative groups with extra scrutiny. And yes. it was done by high senior, senior yes. officials in the IRS. Not high senior officials. It was done by... It was known uh, it was by It was done them. by... Uh, yes, uh, some of them uh, knew about it. Um, but we didn't know about it. And let me say... Uh, what it was was they were applying, there's a special tax exemption for certain uh, categories of organizations that spend most of their money educating the public and not on campaigns. So their job is to determine are these campaign organizations or are they education organizations. It so happens that the preponderance of people who were applying for it were these groups that were motivated anti-Obama groups. Now they stupidly, I think, used um, you know, it may have been uh, algorithms that produced it, but designations of Tea Party, conservative, and so on. I think it's prima facie evidence that nobody political was involved in this because anybody with an ounce of political sense would have said, this is idiotic, what are you guys doing? And as it turns out, this is the scandal, so-called scandal, is not really going anywhere because they, Congress keeps calling people and they keep saying the same thing, which was the bureaucrats in the middle level were trying to cut their workload and they were using shortcuts and nobody ordered them to do it. And certainly the White House didn't order them and to do it. And although you don't work for the president anymore, did you get a phone call? from the Oval Office. David, where do I go from here? No, I think that they're, very, they're highly skilled people over there. I talk to my friends over there, but, uh, but th I think that they've handled it as well as you can handle it. And I wonder when you still were working there, and I read that the New York Times revealed a couple of years ago that the White House had a controversial kill list of Islamic terrorist targets, and one of the important parts of that revelation was that you sat on those meetings when it was drawn up. I wonder, have you ever seen people in such moments stand up to the president and oppose Let me just say this. Um, I never sat in on any of those meetings, and that was a mistake, and I don't know if they've corrected it. I know that I, I, I've, I've said that, and I think there's, there, there's ample evidence to support the fact that I never sat in we on them. We need no evidence but, in but this country. Uh, but I, in this but country, I, we believe But I have seen him make difficult decisions, and I have seen um, debates over life and death issues, uh, debates about the striking the right balance. Uh, you know, we're having the debate right now, you mentioned that, say, on, on, on issues, civil liberties issues and security issues, and difficult, is, is difficult issues. Is there something special about his take on it? Because I hear people tell, tell me also about the way he grasps a subject, the way he asks the question. Is there something special about the way this person makes decisions? Well, it is, it is what I um, said earlier. More than anybody I've ever known, he does think in the long term. He has a, you know, he's a former constitutional lawyer. He has enormous um, regard for what the Constitution means to us, he, enormous regard for civil liberties. He's also the commander in chief with the responsibility of protecting American lives. And his conversations were constantly about striking the right balance, not sacrificing uh, uh, on the one side or on the other, but striking the right balance. And I think he thinks about what his, like on the NSA issue, I think he feels we've struck the right balance, but uh, his concern is always setting up checks and balances because he may be responsible, but what about presidents in the future? And is there a structure in place to make sure that these authorities, which are necessary to save lives, uh, are not abused in the future? He came here yes. a couple of months ago and forced that famous bridge, managed to combine support, affection, and a couple of warnings in one speech and several gestures. Yes. But will, in your mind, in your opinion, Will he risk any political capital to reignite the peace process in this area? I think he's, as he said here, he is very committed to it. Secretary Kerry is, I think, about to make, if he hasn't started already, his fifth visit here since taking office. I think anybody involved will tell you that he's uh, been very, very aggressive uh, with the parties uh, on this. I, this is something that the president believes is enormously important and very timely. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't think he views it in terms of risking political 
capital. I think he views it in terms of um, uh, being effective in trying to move uh, the issue and get something done, understanding that ultimately it's the parties who have to do this, and we can we can be helpful. We can be, we can supply ideas and encouragement. We can supply support for what what is decided, but ultimately the parties have to uh, have to take that that leap. Here's one which is not open. It is a rather close question. Does Barack Obama trust Bibi Netanyahu? They've worked close, he's met with them more than anybody else. They've worked closely together. I think he has an appreciation for, um, you know, the, the difficult issues that uh, the prime minister faces. Um, and, uh, but I don't think he's gonna stop uh, strongly, strongly urging uh, him to step forward uh, as he will with, uh, with uh, President Abbas. Uh, this is a moment. And the president feels strongly that if this moment passes, the next moment isn't nearly as clear. But let me just say one thing. I know we're yeah. five minutes over here, so I appreciate those who remain uh, and your patience. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say how moving it was to hear from these young people. And you know, one, I told you earlier that one of the things that I most relished about my campaign experience was to work with young people, idealistic young people who are skeptical but they're not cynical and they believe that they can change the world and I believe they can change the world and I believe these young people have the capacity uh, to change the world. And in your case, and in your case, after playing the, politi the political game for so long, also in the rough streets of Chicago, it didn't make you cynical? You know, I, uh, I've had moments when uh, I was despairing. I mentioned one of them was back in 10, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when I paired up with Obama. One of the great gifts of the Obama experience has been that it allowed me to leave politics the way I came in as an idealist. Uh, I believe deeply in him. We've had a wonderful relationship. I think he practices politics the way I believe politics should be practiced. And so he's, I told him uh, on the day that we won re-election, I said, you've given me a great gift, you've given me my idealism back. That's what you told him. Did he ever surprise you? Um, did he ever surprise me? Yes, he surprised me. I've, I've said this before. When he, he, he told me that he was going to appoint Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State. You didn't believe it's going to happen? I, well, I, I, it never occurred to me. You know, it's not like politics. In, you know, here you form coalitions and so on. In America, uh, it's not quite the same way. Uh, and they had run a two-year campaign. It was a sometimes a harsh campaign. Um, and so, um, you know, I was surprised. And I learned something important about him, which was his ability to look beyond. I mean, he said, look, she, she's smart, she's tough. We were friends before we were opponents. And if she's on the team, she'll, she's going to be a loyal part of that team. And one of the nice stories about the administration was the relationship that they grew. There is genuine respect and affection between them that runs very, very deep. Which even surprised you? It, it, did that surprise me? Well, I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect, but I was really pleased to see it because I'd like to believe that you can bitterly and vigorously contest issues and still have respect for the people on the other side of that battle and still see their worth and their value. And he understood that, and, and we're frankly a stronger country for that. You know that we, we really have to wrap it up, but perhaps some people in the audience don't know that David is missing something. He is missing his mustache. And he almost sacrificed it during the campaign, right? You had a yes, bet. Yes, I bet, I bet on television. I bet my mustache because there was a lot of bad polling in the election. And one uh, rather over-eager commentator said we were going to lose a bunch of states. I told him we were going to win a bunch of those states. And we were going to win some that he, other words, that, that he was skeptical about. And if I was wrong, I'd shave my mustache off. If he was wrong, he'd grow one. He didn't want to grow one. So we, we won. We won. We, I, I was right about this. And he offered me uh, $10,000 for my wife's Epilepsy Foundation. Uh, uh, this is a cause of our lifetime because of us, uh, our child's experience with epilepsy. My wife said $10,000 isn't enough. 
go back and say, if we can raise a million dollars by the end of November, then you will shave your mustache off still on television. And we raised a million two, million two for epilepsy research. But, and, you know, I always say my wife would cut anything off of me for epilepsy. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I also learned we got 10 steps away. I did this on national television. We got 10 steps away. And um, she said to me, I always hated that thing anyway. <laughs> now, we've been married 33 years, and I had the mustache the whole time. <laughs> so now I'm wondering whether this whole thing was just an elaborate scheme on her part <laughs> to get me to shave off my mustache. But, but I'm not, uh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I'm missing my mustache, but these people are missing dinner. <laughs> David Axelrod, I thank you so much. Thanks. for It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.